So we have begun, begun the broadcast and we will declare that we have a quorum present. I believe we have all five members of the board here. So we have a quorum. Uh, are there any additions to the agenda? Seeing none, we move to the approval of minutes uh, for the opening close meetings of December 16, 2021. I believe those were disseminated. Uh, I move that they be approved. Uh, Great. Mr. Chair. We have a motion that they be approved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, all those, any anyone not in favor, we'll do this the easy way since I think Sky's on a little bit of a delay. If anyone is not in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by raising your hand. Seeing no dissensions, the minutes pass as read unanimously. So now we move on to the administrator's report. I would just like to mention again, as, as always, if, um, if, if each person's report, uh, just highlight whatever you think is important and uh, there's no need to just read out uh, into the record what's already been disseminated. So um, who's starting? Uh, good afternoon. I'll start. Nikki Charlson, Deputy Administrator. Um, wanted to highlight just a few things. Um, we last week briefed the Ways and Means Committee. This is the House Committee that has uh, jurisdiction over election matters. Um, and so we have every session they ask us to come to either talk about the last election or talk about the upcoming one. And so obviously we talked about the coming one and also updated them on the implementation of various bills that they all passed last year. Um, it was less than an hour and we provided a link to the briefing if you wish to watch it. Also wanted to highlight the work of our office and the Prince George's Board of Elections for the special election. Um, the primary election, special primary is certified and everything is done and we are well into um, the general election. Today is day two of early voting. I think it's day two, day two of early voting. Um, we've mailed out ballot packets to all uh, voters in that district. And so things are marching along. Election day is the first and the election is scheduled to be certified on February 10th. And then with that, I will turn it over to Jen to uh, provide an update on the next section. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Um, just a couple of things following up on. First is the mail-in voting forms and information about the use, usability, ugh, excuse me, usability review. We have completed the usability review with um, the University of Baltimore and the Center for Civic Design. And we will be providing that to the um, General Assembly, specifically the Senate EHE committee as required under the bill from last year. Um, there's also the mail and ballot request form mailer. Uh, we are um, starting tomorrow. Um, application, applications for mail in balloting uh, will be going out. Uh, more than 3 million um, applications will be going out to um, in, in, in various phases, three phases. Um, and that will allow people to um, register if they would like to, to be a mail in ballot voter. Uh, that, that form, which you all were incredibly helpful in getting finalized and, and uh, updated, reflects everything that University of Baltimore uh, suggested we do to make this um, simpler for uh, voters and uh, simpler for election officials as well. Um, finally, the permanent absentee ballot list confirmation mailing. Later in February, we will be sending out notice as required by law to everyone who has registered so far as a permanent absentee ballot voter. Um, and that, that will just confirm that they are on that list. And as always, we'll remind them they can change their, um, change that choice or change other things about the registration given certain deadlines. So that's my update, Nikki. Thank you. Who's up next under voter registration, I guess. Hi, good afternoon, Mary Kramer Wagner. Uh, the only thing that I have to report on is that we are currently testing the next iteration and release of MD Voters, which is 8.3. <clears throat> Excuse me. This uh, release will include the automation of permanent absentee letters and reports and exports that Jen was just speaking of. It will also uh, 
touch on the curing of unsigned mail-in ballots and uh, updated street files and reports, which are going to be needed for redistricting. And the release is scheduled for February 2022. So hopefully I will have a great uh, report for you for the March that it was all successful. <laughs> great, thank you. Who's up next? So it would be me, uh, and the Scene Campaign Finance Division. Uh, so uh, let's see, as of, I think, yesterday, we had uh, 321 candidates file for, at, at SBE. So it's, as you can see, that the numbers are increasing uh, dramatically uh, uh, every day uh, with candidate filings, and they're still being currently scheduled by appointment. And so th there is a lot of slots uh, still available. Uh, the 2022 annual report was due on Wednesday, the, the 19th, and almost 89% of the committees filed timely. So that was a very high number and very happy about that. And those committees who have yet to file are going to receive the notice about late fees. Uh, the maximum penalty for a late fee is $1,000. And we had another little filing as well for the Prince George's special election on January 21st. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, you know, and then the rest is uh, uh, if there's any questions there as well. So just about public financing and how many uh, candidates have filed for the state and local programs as well. So. Thank you. Are there any questions for any of the reports so far from the board? Uh, seeing none, uh, are we on to, I guess, voting systems? Yeah, I don't. I don't see Shafiq on the on the line, so I'll just highlight for you um, the electronic poll books. So we were scheduled um, to present the poll book contract at the Board of Public Works on January 5th. Um, that item was withdrawn, and we were at yesterday's Board of Public Works meeting. Um, <clears throat> excuse me to present the new the contract for the new poll book solution. Um, there were some questions, and so it was deferred until the February, I think it's the 16th meeting, um, in regards to uh, we'll, in the meantime, comply with the Comptroll's request to facilitate a meeting, which we'll, we're starting to work on now. Um, so hopefully at the next month, in addition to um, Mary's updates about MD voters, we'll hopefully be able to provide you an update with, on the poll book contract. Great. Thank you. We move on to project management, unless there's any other questions for voting systems. Project management. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my report um, in the inventory document management in Baltimore City lo uh, relocation is there for you to uh, review. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Any questions for project management? How about uh, legislation? Hi, this is Donna Duncan. Uh, just, you know, we are following right now about 75 pieces of legislation. I've sent a separate list. Um, and if there are specific questions about any of those pieces of legislation, uh, Jared can probably, <laughs> uh, no, between all of us, we could probably respond if, if you have questions, but otherwise just uh, we're adding to that list every day. Great. Are there any questions on, on uh, legislation? I'm sure uh, it's too early to ask if any of them look like they have the possibility of making it out of committee. It's probably a bit premature for that. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes. They the redistricting bill, right? <laughs> right, exactly. That that seems to be passing uh, very, very fast. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions about uh, legislation? Thank you. Um, I believe that concludes the administrator's report. Is that correct? Is there anything else to add? Uh, okay. That's it. Thank you. 
So then let's move on to the illustrious Assistant Attorney General's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, quite a bit to add to our litigation list this week. I suppose this befits an election year now that we're in 2022. Um, so the first matter is Fusaro versus Davitt. That matter um, was uh, the PEPA. Uh, we, we prevailed in the Fourth Circuit. There was still an outstanding petition for en banc review by the uh, plaintiff. Uh, that was uh, denied shortly after our last meeting. Um, and so that case, I expect, will conclude now. We're still within the period in which the uh, plaintiff can seek um, uh, Supreme Court review. Uh, but as I believe you all know, that's uh, those are rarely given in this day and age. So he may still seek it, though, and, and I'll keep this active until that window closes. Uh, the next matter, Winred versus Ellison, this was the lawsuit brought by when read the fundraising uh, entity uh, that assists Republican candidates across the country, um, uh, they were suing to enjoin a investigation by the uh, Maryland, New York, Connecticut, and Minnesota attorneys general into their use, Winred's use of uh, pre-checked recurring donation boxes. Um, yesterday, the court issued an order uh, denying Winred's preliminary injunction and granting the defendants uh, motions to dismiss. So. Uh, barring further um, action in that case, uh, the states are free to continue their investigations uh, as of right now. Uh, the next matter is the Connors versus State of Maryland. This is the suit by the plaintiff to um, uh, make private a lot of the voter data uh, that is currently uh, publicly available on voter lists um, in the state. Uh, we had a hearing on January 5th on the plaintiff's uh, motion for a preliminary injunction, which would have asked uh, that her name be uh, redacted from public documents, both in the State Board of Elections, uh, pri primarily at the State Board of Elections, and that we be re refrained from using her name in public meetings. Um, that motion was denied, uh, still pending as our motion to dismiss. That's scheduled to be heard uh, by a virtual hearing on February 14th of next month. The next matter is a new matter, one of several. Um, this was filed. Um, in uh, the federal court, Baltimore County branch of the NAACP versus Baltimore County and several other defendants, several other plaintiffs. This is a challenge uh, to the Baltimore County uh, legislative or ca county council district map um, on grounds that the district violates section two of the Voting Rights Act. Um, the state board of elections is not a party. However, the Baltimore County Board of Elections is a party. Uh, there is a hearing scheduled on a preliminary injunction uh, motion by the plaintiffs uh, for February 15th, 2022. Uh, and so hopefully this will be resolved um, at or around that time. Uh, the next matter is the first of two lawsuits brought uh, to challenge the state's congressional redistricting map that was passed uh, during the special legislative session that was convened in December of last year. Um, this first one was filed on December 21st um, by several individual plaintiffs um, challenging the map under Article 7 of the Declaration of Rights and Article 3, Section 4 of the Maryland Constitution. Um, before I get to the second part of that, I will describe the second lawsuit, uh, as captioned Zaliga versus Lamone. This was filed two days later, also in Anne Arundel County Circuit Court. Uh, by several individual plaintiffs. This one challenges the congressional redistricting map under four different provisions of the Constitution, Article 7, 24, and 40 of the Declaration of Rights, and Article 1, Section 7 of the Maryland Constitution. Um, in both cases, um, I should say the response to the Zalia complaint is due tomorrow. Uh, the response to the Parrott complaint is due on February 20th, 2022. Uh, in the meantime, in both cases, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee has filed a motion to intervene as a defendant, along with, a, in the Parrott case, a proposed motion to dismiss, and in the Saliga case, a proposed answer to the complaint. Um, we have, in the Saliga case, until the 7th to respond to that motion, and in the Parrott case, we have until the 20th to respond to that motion. Uh, the next matter is in the matter of Seth Wilson. Uh, you all are familiar with Mr. Wilson because he appeared the last meeting to oppose the um, approval of the early voting centers for Washington County. 
Uh, since that time, he has filed a petition for judicial review of that administrative determination, as well as the administrative determination of the local board in setting the, the locations in the first place. Um, on January 19th, the agencies, uh, we and the local board were advised of the, or given notice of the filing by the clerk of the court. Uh, we are compiling the administrative record for that uh, case. Uh, it was filed under uh, rule seven, or sorry, yeah, title seven of the Maryland rules um, that deal with administrative review of um, a judicial review of administrative decisions. It's uh, a little bit more streamlined than a regular civil case. A record gets filed and then the parties brief and then uh, the court holds a hearing and that is the end of it. We are of course trying to have it resolved on a slightly um, more accelerated schedule than what the rules would otherwise allow so that in the event that relief is awarded to the, the plaintiff, the local board has time to um, accommodate that in advance of early voting uh, in June. Um, and then the final matter is another matter that uh, the State Board of Elections is not a party in. Um, neither is the Prince George's County Board of Elections, but it is going to impact the election in that county, so I've included it. This is Thurston versus Prince George's County. It is a challenge by several plaintiffs um, to the uh, county redistricting map in PG County on the grounds that the map was promulgated by resolution of the county and not uh, by law of the county, which they allege was required, uh, and that therefore the map is inv invalid. Um, we are monitoring and will um, seek to uh, have our views known about the schedule uh, in that case, if that event, in the event that uh, that becomes necessary. But again, we hope to have that resolved uh, in short order as well. Uh, so that uh, concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pento. Does anyone have any questions for the Assistant Attorney General? Uh, I had one quick one. With the two redistricting cases, uh, timing of them to be able to affect the election this year, where are we with that? Um, well, we're not anywhere with that. Those cases were filed. Um, there has been, you know, we're under the normal kind of court schedule for responding to complaints. Um, and uh, uh, that's that's how we're proceeding. There has been no request for emergency relief by any of the plaintiffs in either of those cases at this time. And so um, we, you know, along the redistricting lines, as Jared, I think it was Jared or Donna mentioned that the General Assembly is considering uh, the state legislative redistricting. Um, there was a bill that came out of committee. I think it passed the Senate, if I'm not mistaken, last week and is before the uh, House of Delegates this week. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the timing, but uh, when they plan to vote on it, but it's imminent. And we expect there to be um, litigation. I would be surprised if there wasn't litigation as a result of that map, um, you know, as soon as shortly after it passes. Uh, the difference between the congressional um, litigation and the state map is under the Constitution, the challenge to the state legislative map is uh, required to be heard by the Court of Appeals. It's in the Court of Appeals uh, as original jurisdiction over those kinds of cases or over the state challenges. So um, the Court of Appeals will no doubt um, want to know what the right schedule is for resolving that case. Uh, but in the congressional cases, there there isn't that kind of original jurisdiction provision. We're just in circuit court for Anne Arundel County and there has not been any request for emergency relief. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions about litigation? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your report, Mr. Trenta. Uh, we move on to item number six of the agenda, which is approval a final adoption of COMAR 33.05.0404B3 and B5, voter registration. Thank you. Uh, so before you today are regulations that you previously approved in September of last year that went out for public comment and um, no public comment was received and now they're back to you for final adoption. Um, there's just two provisions, as, as the chairman mentioned. One is just codifying or, or making it reflect current practice. And the other is a provision that was enacted in the last legislative session about 
uh, common access cards, using them to digitally sign uh, certain forms by military and overseas voters who have that form. So I'm happy to answer questions about these, uh, this, I guess it's really one regulation being amended two subsections, um, but it's before you for final adoption. Thank you very much. Are there any questions about Comar, Comar 33.05 and following? Is there a motion uh, that someone would like to make to um, approve as presented? So moved. It has been moved to accept the final adoption of, I'm just, go ahead, somebody who's gonna second. We have a move, motion and a second to approve the final adoption of Comar.33.05.04.04B .04 subsection three and B subsection five voter registration processing of VRAs that was originally proposed in the September 9th meeting. All those in fig, uh, in favor, please signify by raising your hand so I can make sure we have quorum on the vote. We have a unanimous vote for the approval. Thank you very much. And we move on now to number seven, which is the approval of the Title 14 waiver requests. Thank you. Uh, so in front of you uh, right now are uh, four requests. Three are for uh, waiving the, the late fees due to, I would say, extraordinary or extenuating circumstances, and one is a reduction uh, due to uh, self-reporting uh, the, the violation and working both with us and, and, and the state ethics as well. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to um, answer any on the specific ones, but if not, I, I just will present uh, for the a motion based upon the recommendations presented. Anybody have any questions for uh, for Mr. Demaris about the um, reduction or the waivers? So uh, the chair would entertain a motion to accept both the waivers and the reduction uh, as presented. I move that we accept the uh, waiver, the three waivers, and the one reduction as presented. Great. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. So we have a motion and a second to accept the, I believe it was three waivers and one reduction That's as right. presented. Uh, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. We have a unanimous vote, and that passes. We move on to the approval of confidentiality requests. Thank you, yes. And we have uh, three confidentiality requests. Um, as you can see, the, what the, the rationale for the confidentiality requests are. So I, I move that we uh, move these voters to a confidentiality status or confidential status. So. Does anybody have any questions? I believe all three of these meet the qualifications uh, very clearly. Um, as I viewed them, does anyone have any questions about that? So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Jared, I just have a quick question. Um, the form for Eric uh, Atos, Atos yep. uh, it was signed by his campaign treasurer. Is that an appropriate signature if a particular individual is seeking a confidentiality um, request? Uh, Did that go through? Um, yeah, I, I could probably go back and get his signature on that. That makes sense. So yeah, we'll, 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 we'll take a look at that. And get that. Would it, right. would it be premature to vote on that, or can we vote on it now and then you just? Yeah, I, I guess if if once once the individual signs and wishes to be a uh, a I would say a confidential voter, uh, we we can make a motion based upon uh, you know I will uh, based upon this once the signature occurs, so that we don't have to bring this back. But I, I can put it 
in the report for the next board meeting that uh, we that I did get the signature. Okay. Okay. So then, very good question. Thank you, uh, Ms. Woodward. I appreciate that. So um, then, the chair would accept a motion to accept fully two of the three requests for confidentiality, and the third one with a um, a caveat that there must be a proper signature required and reported back at the next meeting. So moved. Is there a second to that? Second. So we have a motion and a second. Again, this is so that two of the confidential requests are approved immediately, and the third one is approved at at proper signature, uh, which will be reported at the next meeting. All those in favor of that signify by raising your hand. Unanimously, unanimously passes. Uh, so the confidentiality requests are complete. We move to the approval of administrative closure of campaign accounts. Yes. So uh, once again, in front of you is uh, two uh, Accounts that are to be administratively closed, Friends of Nat Oaks. Uh, that was basically uh, the committee, uh, the individual had went to prison over certain issues here. State prosecutor uh, is, you know, finding any prosecutions uh, regarding the campaign accounts. There has been no activity and the bank account, while there's surplus funds and everything that exists there, all the records and everything have been basically are gone. And we haven't had a report that was filed since 19 on this. And so at this point here, with the recommendation of the state prosecutor, we believe that this is, uh, you know, ex extenuating circumstances uh, requiring uh, closure to just because no one's going to enforce any sort of uh, actions against this uh, committee. The second one is Chris uh, Boardman here. The uh, treasurer had died uh, four years ago, and with that, have no, we have no records. And the candidate is now moved out of state, so uh, and is not wanting to return. So there is no way of getting any records or any action against that individual here. Uh, again, uh, the bank balance has been reported as zero. And uh, so, you know, the amendment process and everything that would be associated with the audit are no longer applicable here, as well as the fact that the, the state prosecutor's office has told us that, you know, they're not pursuing this matter as well. So, both these were, you know, meet the, the, the criteria for administratively closing, and we, we present them to you. Anyone have any questions uh, about these several accounts to be administratively closed? So if I understand correctly, the, the accounts that show a cash balance that's that's a record balance but in fact there's nothing there is that the way it's working correct right they're basically they didn't report all their contributions so in a normal situation you know if a, if a campaign comes in and wants to close with either a surplus of account or if there if there's a negative dollars we don't let them close we would say that you can be inactive and you would have to you know audit and give us all the records and that's when as you can see in the beginning part, our, some of our enforcement actions occur, which we go, you didn't report all your contributions, you, you didn't, um, you know, you didn't maintain all your records and everything else. These two situations here, uh, the state prosecutors basically said, you know, we're not pursuing this. And, the, and the, with the candidate in another state, they're not going to do any sort of extradition for <laughs> to bring them in uh, for that. So, and so it's just to get them off of our books at this point here. Any other questions? <clears throat> Seeing none, the chair would entertain a motion to- I do have one question, sorry, Mr. Chair. Sure, yes, please. Um, 
and I'm not that I'm saying it should happen, but I guess is there any precedent for like the treasurer? I guess um, not liability, or could would that be avenue for enforcement, like for the one committee with the candidate incarcerated? Just kind of curious. Uh, in 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 theory, yes. Uh, you know, because they are a responsible officer for that. Uh, that that committee went through many uh, different. Uh, uh, I would say that was looked at uh, by law enforcement thoroughly and everything else. So, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the, the treasurer is not wanting to sign and not wanting to do anything more on that committee with the theft and the candidate having some records uh, was one of the reasons why I think the state prosecutor's office was saying it, it, you can just close this now. Because uh, if there, there would, that individual is thoroughly looked at for, for, for crimes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, the chair would entertain uh, a motion to administratively close the friends of Nathaniel Oaks and the friends of Chris Boardman. So moved. So, moved. so we have two motions. Turn one into a, a second, please. And uh, we now will vote. All those in favor? of administratively closing these two accounts as presented, please raise your hand. Unanimously passes and they are closed. Thank you very much. We are moving on to the approval of early voting centers. And I believe we have three counties to do, is that correct? We actually have Four. We had one come in late yesterday. Queen Anne's was um, submitted separately, but that is actually just an optional early voting center that early that already existed. It's follow up from your request last meeting. Okay. Um, let me see if I can present. Usually, David, do I have the little presenting option coming my way? There it is. Thank you. All right. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so we have just two new um, counties that didn't get presented last month and then follow up on two optional early voting centers um, to kind of close the loop on that. I'll start with the new counties, uh, the first of which is Anne Arundel. Um, they are proposing new early voting centers um, then I'll move to Harford, which is uh, proposing a change of their early voting center. And they're also using their fourth optional early voting center. So I'd like to get the board's approval on that as well. And then follow up on Montgomery County's optional early voting center, which we discussed last month uh, at the meeting. So Anne Arundel is going to have a total of nine early voting centers. They have um, three total new locations. Two uh, are new early voting centers and ones that change to an existing early voting center. 92% um, of their voters live within five miles of the early voting center, and they serve areas of below average voter turnout <laughs> and above average concentration of diverse residents. I have some maps for you guys again. This is the clean map of um, all of the nine locations. This is their voter density map. This is the minority population map. Voter turnout. And then I'll just kind of go through, um, as I did last month, each of the locations. The first of which is the Deal Elks Lodge, and this is a new center. Um, it is accessible and allows for electioneering. It has adequate parking and can handle estimated peak voting hours, and this serves the southern area of the county. 
the photo of the outside and then the layout of the inside. And then our recommendation to approve. And did you guys want me to just kind of go through each county and wait until the end to ask for your approval? I think we could do uh, all all centers in Anne Arundel County for sure. And then we'll see what's it. If there's anything that you think is controversial, we should we should uh, um, segregate it. But other than that, you can put together all of them in each county. Okay, great. Yep. The next one is uh, Laurel Racetrack, and this is another new location. It's accessible for 2022. It allows for electioneering and has adequate parking. It's accessible to public transportation and can handle peak voting hours. And again, this is in one of the below average um, voter turnouts and above average concentration of diverse residence areas. This is the entrance and the inside of this location. And then this one is a replacement. It's gonna replace Glen Burnie Library, which Anne Arundel County has just kind of outgrown. Um, it's accessible and allows for electioneering, has adequate parking um, and accessible to public transportation. Can handle peak voting hours and is a, an, in an area of below average voter turnout and above average concentration of diverse residents. This is the hall. It's much larger than what they're using now. So that actually wraps up Anne Arundel County. Great. Are there any questions that anybody has for Anne Arundel County? Seeing no questions, the chair would entertain a vote to approve the three early voting sites for Anne Arundel County as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the three uh, early voting sites for Anne Arundel County signify by raising your hand. Uh, and passes unanimously. And I'll move to Harford County. Um, Harford County is required to have three early voting centers, but they've opted to have four. They're replacing an existing early voting center with a new early voting center. They had previously had their early voting center in Aberdeen. Um, however, they've run into some problems with electioneering in that location. They're unable to um, get space outside of the no electioneering zone for people to electioneer. Um, so they're having to move to Haver de Grace, um, which is also a much larger facility. It's about five miles down the road. Um, the, with the new location, 85% of voters will live within five miles of one of the early voting centers and um, their are areas of below average voter turnout and above average concentration of diverse residents are served. Um, there is a fourth early voting center, which is in Jarrettsville that I will also ask that you approve um, is the, let's see, the Jarrettsville Fire Hall, um, which has been approved by their county council. Um, and we would ask that the board approve that as well. Oops, sorry about that. This is the voter um, density map. The minority population map. Voter turnout. And so the Haber de Grace Activity Center is their early voting center three. It replaces Aberdeen. It's accessible. It allows for the electioneering um, requirements to be met and is accessible by public transportation, has adequate parking, and can handle peak voting hours. And this is also near an area of a below average voter turnout and above average concentration of outside of the facility. And then this will be the inside. And 
so the recommendation would be to approve this location. Anyone have any questions about the Habity Grace? Uh, and I believe this vote would be on two Habity Grace early voting sites. Is that correct? I mean, two Harford County early. Yes. Voting. So Habity Grace is the new location, and then we would ask that you also vote on approving their optional site, the use of their fourth optional site. Right. Right. Are there any questions about? Uh, the approval of, we're talking about a, a one site that's moving and, and a fourth site, uh, which would be um, coming into play. And I believe we had a letter, was that on Harper County? Or was that a different county? It was, it was on the move from Aberdeen to Habertigris. Okay. Um, I don't know if any of the board members had a chance to see that. I know it came in very late. I don't know if there's any questions about that. I believe um, the director at Harper County is available if you want to ask any questions. Does anyone on the board have any questions about what they've read and what has been presented? Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I guess I would like to hear from somebody from Harper County uh, in reference to the letter that we received. Uh, Oh, are the comments valid or, or what's, what's the uh, rebuttal to these comments? Okay, Mr. Fon, that's a very fair question. Um, and uh, ha has the Harper County director seen the letter that came in? I'm not sure if she has seen the letter. I have spoken to her about the move. So I know that she would be able to speak to kind of why that move had to happen. That would be great. If she's available, can we bring her on to answer Mr. Fon's question? Good afternoon, this is Stephanie Taylor, Director of Harper County Board of Elections. Um, the reason we decided to move the center is the um, city of Aberdeen is, is incorporated, it's a municipality, and the area directly across from the facility is a public park, and according to their charter, they do not allow um, political signs in the park. So we went up there, and we were trying to come up with a compromise, and they were able to give us a section, like, 20 foot section just to the left of the facility. Um, but if you're in Aberdeen, that you know, a lot of participation from the um, local politicians. And I know that would be a, a, a major um, issue for them. Uh, we will get complaints, the city will get complaints. Also the facility is rather small. In this past election, we had to, for social distancing, we had to put the um, polling place in two different rooms which I was not very comfortable with because didn't I didn't feel we had proper supervision in both rooms. And then um, it, again, it's directly across from the park. So there's a lot of traffic and it's a lot of foot traffic. So we were concerned about somebody getting injured as well. So those are like the major reasons we changed it to Happy Grace because Happy Grace is like three times the size of um, Aberdeen. It's also almost exactly like another facility we have. So we've already, basically, you know, got the whole layout and everything um, figured out for Havity Grace. It's right smack on a bus line. Um, another benefit is that um, our Havity Grace is big enough that we don't have to have the county cancel all the activities in the center for eight days, whereas Aberdeen, all the activities have to be canceled for eight days because we have to use the entire building. The parking up in uh, Havity Grace is much more, much more parking up there. It's safer. We have our own entrance to the facility away from a lot of the foot traffic. Um, we are keeping a uh, mail-in ballot drop box in Aberdeen. So we figure that way we can, you know, help serve the community in that, in that way. Thank you very much for that response. Mr. Fund, did you have any questions to that or any other board members have any questions for Ms. Taylor? Uh, Ms. Taylor, have you had the opportunity to uh, address this particular person personally in reference to the change? I have not seen the letter. Uh, I found out about it uh, today when I was talking to Melissa. I'm not 100% sure of everything that was in the letter. I don't know who the individual is. I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with her. 
Well, I, I would encourage you to do so uh, if you get the opportunity. And perhaps we can provide you with a copy of the letter if you have not received one. Yes, that would be nice. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions about uh, Harper County? And there, this would be two sites, one move and one fourth site that's already been approved by the local government. So the chair would in, uh, entertain a motion uh, to approve the change and the fourth site as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Been moved second. And second. All those in favor signify please by raising your hand. And it's unanimous. So we moved to, I think, Montgomery County? Yep. And this one is just a follow up from um, last month the, that uh, they were opting to use their 14th center. Um, and we are presenting it again for board approval now that the county council has formally approved um, the use of the 14th center. Okay, great. More of the background. Um, the board had no objections to this site or the use of an optional early voting center. Just wanted to make sure that the county council approved it first. Right. Are there any questions about Montgomery County? So we'd entertain a, a motion to approve the Montgomery County extra early voting site uh, since it has been approved by the local government. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by raising your hand. And again, we are unanimous. Okay, and then the last one that I have is Queen Anne's County. And this is again, just a um, follow up last month, you had requested that any counties that were using an optional early voting center be presented. Um, oh, I skipped to the end, sorry about that. Um, that they be presented for approval to the board. So this is an existing center. They've used it for about 10 years and um, they have gotten county commissioners uh, formal approval. It is the Kent Island Fire Department. And we would just request that you approve that um, optional early voting center. And I'm sorry, I, I, it has been approved by the local government, right? It has. Great. Uh, any questions? Is there a motion to approve the extra early voting site for Queen Anne's County as presented? So moved. There's a second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by raising your hand. Great, it is unanimous. Okay. Are there any further early voting centers? No, that is all of them. It's wonderful, great job. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. So with that being done, we move on to old business. Uh, before we move on to the speakers of old business, is there any other old business we need to address? Um, so at this time, then we move on. I believe we have two speakers. Am I correct? That have to speak um, about um, uh, an old an item that came from old business that we discussed before and had chosen not to do anything at this time. So um, who is the first speaker on the list? Donna, do you have the list of the two individuals? I do not have the specific name. Um, David, uh, Ms. Walker is listed second. The first speaker begins with the S, first name begins with an S. Uh, 
I can't see other attendees, so I think somebody from the staff would need to find. They're, they're unmuted. They can talk now. Okay. Thank you. Um, should I begin? Sure. Yeah. Uh, just explain who you are, too, so that the board knows. Yes, my name is Suchitra Balachandran. I live in Prince George's County, and I'm here representing the Committee to Restore Term Limits and Our Revolution Prince George's. You have my written testimony. I sent something in um, a couple of days ago, and I also sent something the last month. So this just piggybacks on that, and I won't repeat everything in it. Uh, this is simply to say that we have been attempting to get uh, to go back to collecting paper signatures since uh, the board revoked the, the, the temporary approval of electronic signatures in May. Um, and we have essentially not, not been successful, not for want of trying, but uh, Prince George's County, while the state lifted the state of emergency in, in June or July, we have maintained our state of emergency since March of 2020 and have basically uh, renewed that state of emergency 20 times now, most recently until March of 2022. And this is because we have had in the past a very high case caseload of COVID. So the activists who are involved in this campaign do, do, I mean, they don't think it's reasonable for them to go out with clipboards. And I don't think it's prudent for us to stop strangers and ask them to sign on to it. So for both those reasons, the only place that we've been successful in, um, in getting signatures is when you have a closed environment, there is a retirement community where some folks are collecting signatures within that building. Uh, but other than that, we have sort of uh, gone through various ideas of trying to collect signatures, including hanging clipboards outside our doors and inviting neighbors through next door to come and sign. But the whole problem with all of that is that we can't actually explain either the proposal to them in a very a concise fashion or ensure that all the fields are signed in the manner in which the state board requires that the fields be filled out that match the voter registration. So this is in fact not um, a workable solution for us at this point. And for all those reasons, we're asking the state board to reinstitute the temporary approval at least until July or August deadline to place the petitions and this question on the ballot in November. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions? And I am I'm amiss to try to pronounce your name. So I'm going to say from our very nice speaker. Are there any questions for our very uh, nice speaker? Mr. Chair, I, I have one question I'd like to ask uh, the speaker, and I'm not going to even attempt to try and pronounce the name. You indicated that uh, you're having difficulty in explaining the purpose of the petition and uh, talking to the people. Prior to getting the electronic signature, wouldn't you have to explain the petition to them and wouldn't you have to explain why you want their signatures and what it's all about? Yes, so we do have a website. We do have information on that that we could uh, you know, target and send people to to look at. But when you're out there trying to get a signature from a person and you, you, you have to actually talk, talk to them and explain what the question on the ballot is about and what the issue is about. And that's the piece we cannot do with somebody we meet on the street to engage in a lengthy conversation about this issue. Whereas if we had it electronically, the person who's going to sign first reads the petition, understands it, and then decides. So you, you, you've taken away the need for a person to be talking to another person. We're also in the process of creating YouTube videos to put online so people can understand what the issue is. We can have conversations. We've had webinars. We can do all of those. But the collection of in-person signatures is where we have trouble because we do have to then meet the person, give them a clipboard, have them sign, collect it back from them, and all of those are hard for us to do. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the speaker? I mean, I mean, this is a question for the speaker or someone on the staff. Is the deadline for signature collection for the general election is uh, July or August? Is that right?
Does anybody have that answer from the staff? When yes, yes, it is. I'm sorry, Mary Kramer Wagner. And yes, it is. So what do you know the exact deadline for electronic it, signature? It is the first Monday in August. First Monday in August. Thank you. Mr. Williams, do you have any other questions for the speaker? Um, I guess, yeah, I'm um, to the speaker too. Uh, I'll pronounce it, uh, Ms. Balachandran. Uh, do you have the, uh, know the number of signatures required? Is it a percentage of the, I guess, the county registered voters for Prince George's County? So we need 10,000 signatures to place the question on the ballot. Um, there are about a million residents in Prince George's. I don't know the number of registered voters off the top of my head. Um, but uh, yeah, we need we need 10,000 signatures. We're probably halfway through. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the speaker? Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Um, I appreciate it. If you would just hang on the line for a few minutes in case the other speaker sparks some questions that anybody on the board may have for you as well. Glad um, to. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming. Who is our who is our other speaker? I believe we had two that requested to speak. Hello, can you hear That's me? Linda Dorsey Walker. Great. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you again this uh, afternoon. I'm Linda Dorsey Walker, a six-term elected member of the uh, Baltimore County Democratic State Central Committee. But today, I come to you as a private citizen who is chair of uh, New Horizons Group. And that's just a small group of nonpartisan non group of average citizens who um, have basically been the genesis of creating this referendum campaign, which we are calling For More. For More for Baltimore County is a ballot issue, and now it's a ballot issue committee by that same name that's been formed to hopefully enlarge the size of the Baltimore County Council. My purpose in coming to you today very similar to the last speaker, is to request an extension of the same document that you passed last year about the same time, SBE policy 2021-01, extension of temporary electronic petition signature acceptance. Very well written, one page, very succinct. All we wish is to have the same document, same one page are done with the date changed. And why? for well, there's very many of the same reasons, except that in our case, we have an even tighter time frame. We're only just now starting the process of this referendum. And the reason is because we needed to see how things would uh, work out relative to redistricting and some of the other things that were going on. We've decided that it's important to uh, give an opportunity to more women, because right now Baltimore County Council only has one woman on it out of seven positions, more minorities, because right now Baltimore County Council only has one minority on it, and more young people. The law was changed two years ago to allow young people as young as 21 to run for office, except that the average age is closer to about 55. So we don't have a lot of diversity. And the effort that we're trying to start has gotten support from people in both the Republican and Democratic parties. People see that it makes sense to try to expand Baltimore County Council. Uh, the current size was set by charter in 1955 when the county only had 350,000 people. And at that time, it was deemed appropriate to have seven 50,000 person um, districts. Now the county has 857,000 people in it and an average size that's nearly 125,000 people. And in case you don't uh, aren't aware, that now not only makes Baltimore County now have the largest districts in the state of Maryland, we now have the largest councilmanic districts in the country. Untenable. If we had four more districts, 
we would be able to shave that size down to 78,000 persons per district and allow a lot more opportunity. Now, as this issue has come up, um, right from the beginning, we've gotten lots of people who have said from different backgrounds, uh, older people, younger people, people who see the advantages for women, for minority, for youth, people from different parties see the advantage of it, but they've all raised the same question. How are we gonna do this? Because we support this, it's overdue. 67 years is long enough. How do we do this in the middle of a COVID epidemic? Baltimore County is still in a state of emergency. It went back into a state of emergency relative to COVID on um, December 27, 2021, and we're still there. At that time, we had a positivity rate of 18.2% out of all the people being tested, and it's gone up. So if you can imagine, with more people having COVID now, and the um, Omicron variant out of control, more people than a year ago, when you passed successfully, you voted successfully to pass the first, the second one of these extensions, since more people have it now, it makes sense to look at how do we allow people to exercise their rights as citizens to amend their charter. We're now in the 246th year of what one of our early presidents called the American experiment of self-governance. And that was the exact term of self-governance. In this particular case, the people have said, Let it, let's put this in the people's hands to go forward and try to amend our charter in the way we feel is appropriate. And they're willing to uh, help support this effort, but they're not willing to die for it. Thank They're you. not willing to die for it. So yeah. I'd appreciate it if you would consider uh, putting the reinstating the earlier uh, status for the policy and, you. and make it effective immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we appreciate mm -hmm. it. And I'm just going to open it up right now to, uh, to questions. If anybody on the board has any questions for uh, Ms. Dorsey Walker. No questions for Ms. Dorsey Walker? Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, and I'm sure that everyone is uh, considering uh, from both testimonies. And uh, I wanna just ask the, uh, the board at this time, is this, is this an issue uh, that the board would like to take up at this time when we discussed it before? and we had uh, not brought it up again uh, due to several thoughts. Um, it, it kind of died in, in the board. Um, I'm looking for the will of the board at this point, what, what the members feel about this, and I'm, um, or if you have any questions for either speaker, um, open the floor up. I'll start, Mr. Chair, okay. I'm just more thinking out loud. Um, uh, I guess I acknowledge the uh, the fact that we're meeting virtually um, it's, uh, at this time, and well, I guess the status quo would still compel um, petition gatherers to be outside. I guess my concern is weighing the factors that you know, the higher risk of, I guess, well, one fraud when it's uh, collect, when signatures are collected electronically, there's less so ability to check um, who's submitting the petition signature, um, if it's valid versus a, uh, I guess either someone nefarious from this country or another country um, signing it, or um, I guess also the issue of, I guess, the sanctity of making sure the will of the voters or people signing the petition is respected where it might be easier to click a button on a website versus read through information and really sign it. Um, <clears throat> so where I'm coming down is that at this point, 
the weighing the factors and the fact that we're not in a state of emergency at the state level or we won't be as of you know, a few days from now, I would lean towards not modifying the rules at this point. Um, especially I'm, I'm thinking too of my friends who door knock now for candidates and a, did, did so during the tenth this time. And you know, they seem to be successful. So that's where I'm coming from right now. It's my position. I'm open to discussion. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I was I was unable to find quickly on the computer the Prince George's County emergency declaration. I did find the Baltimore County one, um, and you know it really has to do with indoor masking and things like that. But it does provide the county with some flexibility to uh, undertake emergency actions, and it's got a, a sunset on it. Um, and so if if there are still quite a few number of months to go to collect signatures, um, you know I kind of echo Mr. Mr. Williams' point that people are getting out and doing these kinds of things. Um, and maybe it's different in some areas and you know, not in others, or maybe, I don't know, but um, I know people who are out there doing this and um, standing around supermarkets and shopping malls and door knocking and all those kinds of things. Um, and I, I haven't heard that it's a whole lot more difficult. It's difficult no matter how you do it. Um, you know, I don't know how many doors I've knocked and how many answers I've gotten, but the percentage is not great. <laughs> um, and I recognize that it's a challenge, but I think that the the benefit of the paper, the, the wet ink signature, um, is pretty strong. And um, you know, I think that we've we're all undergoing or have undergone the Omicron spike. Spike, um, but the Baltimore County uh, State of Emergency, for example, I think it expires about now. I mean, it's pretty pretty quick timeline. Um, so I think there's there should be enough time to accomplish this, and it does require some shoe leather, um, but I'd be inclined to, to not take this approach. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Appreciate that. Anyone else on the board? There's another, I guess, discussion early question, maybe for staff, maybe Jared, you know, as I recall last session, the General Assembly introduced legislation to provide for a digital signature or electronic signature that did not make it out of committee. And so do you happen to know if there's legislation proposed this term? Uh, so far, there is no uh, legislation proposed. So I guess that further leads me to side with keeping the status quo in place if the General Assembly um, didn't see fit to act. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate or my view is it's not, not appropriate for the board to to take an action when the General Assembly decided not to. Anyone else on the board like to speak to this issue? I would have to uh, concur with the uh, views of uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Williams, I uh, I don't see where we as a board to try and usurp the existing policy as it is now and recognizing that uh, some of the uh, restrictions that are in place now are going to be lessened in the future. I, I would tend not to, to uh, try and change the, the system presently. Thank you, Mr. Fun. Ms. Woodward, do you have a something you'd like to input on this? There we go. Okay. Um, I concur with the comments of my fellow board members. Um, and, and I and I certainly appreciate um, our speakers and their issues and um, their testimony. I was I I, I I think I can speak for all of us. We very much respect where um, these folks are coming from. Um, but um, it seems as if we are in a place where um, restrictions will start to be lifted, hopefully. And there is a window of time 
um, which would seem to be adequate uh, for the groups uh, that are um, collecting signatures to be able to um, put that effort in. And um, even if they have to wait a little bit uh, until things ease and they feel safer, um, it, it seems to be a reasonable um, reasonable period of time to get done what needs to be done. Um, and I, I concur with my with the other members of the board. Um, it just doesn't seem to be something that we need to um, make that change at this time. We, of course, could revisit that if a month from now um, it's worse than it is now. Um, but I think that we're trending in a better direction. Um, so. Thank you very much. It seems to the chair that the will of the board is not to move uh, on this, which is in a, sen in a, in a essentially saying uh, what the board's will is on this. Um, it would take a motion and a second uh, to, um, to, to bring this forward. And uh, just from listening to the comments, uh, it doesn't sound like we have uh, the will for either a motion or a second. So I think this issue will, will stay where it is for now. And we can certainly revisit this in old business if things change, as to Ms. Woodward's point. Um, so unless and there's any objection, and I certainly don't want to ever ramrod anything. So is there any objection to moving on to the next issue from any member of the board? No objection. And I guess to be that echo the point that I'd be open to reconsidering if the situation hopefully it does not, but if it does change or um if things trend the wrong direction, public health wise, um, in the spring and summer. Okay. Thank you. So we will then move on. Is there any other? And thank you very much. And th again, thank you to the speakers. I truly appreciate that's part of the process. And we want to make sure um, that at the appropriate times, those that uh, want to be heard can. Thank you very much again. Is there any other old business to address? Seeing none, is there any new business? Is there any disclosure of campaign contributions? Seeing none, uh, let's talk about our next meeting. I believe that our meeting date has been changed and we are going to combine the uh, February and March meetings into one meeting. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, anybody on the staff, because I have messed this up already uh, in some of our internal communications. Um, but we will be meeting February 10th. So I think we circulated that with the board and everybody was good with that day. I'm sorry, it's March 10th. Sorry, March, see what I did? I'm very bad. So there will be no February meeting and uh, there will be, so the next meeting will be a combination of February and March and that meeting will be on March 10. And let me, and uh, just wanna make sure, does that, is that still continue to work for everybody on the board? Okay, no problems with March 10. Okay, so our next meeting is March 10. There will be no February meeting at first. We want, we're just trying to keep that on the schedule in case there was business that had to be addressed, but I don't believe that um, it looks like there will be any. So our meeting will be on March 10th. There will be no meeting in February. We do have a closed session today. Um, and I wanna say that we, um, we will not be coming back into the open session just to close the meeting. Um, so the close, the open session will be closed as we leave and move into closed session. I'm gonna read um, now why we're going into closed session. So, um, so you don't have to continue to hang out in the open session. We will not be coming back here. Um, I'm gonna say now that the board will now consider whether to meet in closed session to discuss the compensation of employees over whom the board has salary setting authority as permitted under section 3-305 subsection B1 of the general provisions article. 
This exemption applies to a discussion among the members of the board regarding a personnel matter that affects a specific individual. Meeting in closed session would allow the members of the board to be briefed on pers personnel matters and share their views without compromising the confidentiality of those discussions. Also, the board will consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and obtain information from staff about pending or potential litigation as permitted, permitted by section 3-305 subsection B7 and 8 of the general provision article. Meeting in closed session will allow members of the board to seek and obtain legal advice with board counsel without waiver of attorney client privilege and obtain information from staff about pending or potential litigation. And I have a motion to meet in closed session. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. So unanimously, we will, uh, the motion having passed, the board will meet in closed session in accordance with exemptions B, subsection one, seven, and eight of sections three, 305 of the Open Meetings Act. So uh, we will reconvene in closed session. Does 325 work for everybody or do you need 10 full minutes? You want 10. So we will meet at 3.30. Let's do it as an, at an exact time. That's a round time. We, we will meet in closed session at 3.30, the open session. We will not come back to close it. And thank you very much for everyone's time today.